Thanks for checking out this movie review video. Uh, this is for the 2016 horror film. Well, all of my reviews are horror film, but it's The Autopsy of Jane Doe. This is one I've been wanting to get to, and actually it's one that when I talk to other horror fans who are, you know, relatively deep into the horror community, um, every single time when this movie comes up, they always say, oh, I love that film. Oh, that film's so good. Oh, that film is underrated. That's another big thing that people say, that the film is underrated. Uh, it doesn't get talked a lot ba uh, past people who are deep into the horror genre. So uh, it's kind of one of those cult classic films, even though it's only from three years ago at this point. But it's already basically a cult classic, in my opinion. And deservedly so. Deservedly so. If people can't hear, I don't know if you can in the background. It's raining right now. It's uh, pretty good rain, so that's appropriate for right now. Because in this film... There's a very big storm that goes on, uh, and as I say that, I need to remind everyone there are spoilers in this. Uh, if you're watching this and you are, haven't already seen it, stop right now, go see it. I do recommend it. Go see it, and then come back, and we'll talk about spoilers. So for the rest of us, let's go. So this film was directed by Andre Overdahl. I don't know if that's how you actually say it, but Overdahl is how I'm going to say it. So he kind of burst onto the horror scene with the film Troll Hunter, which is kind of like a found footage film of people in Scandinavia hunting gigantic trolls. It's a pretty fun film, and I would recommend seeing that. So that's how he kind of busted onto the scene. Then he did Autopsy Jane Doe, but then he's also more recently done the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark film that Guillermo del Toro was attached to, but he was the director for it. So... The impetus for him to do the autopsy of Jane Doe was that he didn't want to be known as the found footage guy. You know, granted, he only did one film that way, but it got big. And, you know, when you come out with stuff like that, you can be branded immediately as that's what you do. That's your thing. So he was like, I want to show people that I can do regular directing and not just found footage. So he wanted to find a legitimately good horror script and he found the script from Ian Goldberg and Richard Nying. Uh, now, these two individuals have worked on mainly just a bunch of, like, TV show scripts, so this was kind of their first big deal as far as, like, a feature-length film. Um, and I think the script is very intelligently written and very uh, suspenseful, and it's got a lot of really good components to it. It's very well executed. You can tell they took time with it. You can tell they kind of did some re-edits and just like really tightened it up. So as far as the acting with this, the the biggest name in this for me and for other people in horror would be Brian Cox. Now he has 221 acting credits on IMDb. Um, he's most well known within the horror community, I think, for his role as the original Hannibal Lecter in the 80s film Manhunter. But then also his awesome, awesome role as Mr. Krieg in the, um, I think it was released in 2009. I think the 2009 release, Trick or Treat, which, not Trick or Treat, Trick or Treat, uh, which is one of my favorite films. I do plan on reviewing that actually within the next week or so. Uh, his role in Trick or Treat is awesome. He's, it's hard to recognize him between that film and The Autopsy of Jane Doe because he looks a lot different because they did a bunch of makeup and prosthetics and stuff on him for Trick or Treat to make him look like John Carpenter. But the voice, you can hear it's the totally same voice. Uh, he's a really good actor. And then Emil Hirsch is in this as the son to um, Brian Cox's character. And he's most well known for being into the film Into the Wild, which I have not seen, but I've heard is good, and I do want to see that. And Speed Racer, which a lot, a lot of people hate. I've seen portions of Speed Racer. I will say it looks amazing. Like, from a visual standpoint, it's aesthetically very, very pleasing. Uh, it seems really hokey and crappy, but I think that's because that's kind of how the, the original anime for Speed Racer was. But some ideas just aren't the best to actually execute that way, you know? But anyway, I haven't seen the whole thing, so who knows? So like I said, yeah, he wanted, uh, Overdahl wanted to prove that he wasn't just doing found footage. So his exact words on when he was looking for a good script to direct in a more traditional sense were he wants a pure horror script, which I think, I don't know if you can say this one is pure horror, but it is definitely horror. It's more like suspense and actual, yes, some horrific things happening. Um, depends on what you're what your uh, definition of pure horror is. 
One of the really interesting things about this is the role of Tommy, which was the one that was played by Brian Cox, was almost done by Martin Sheen. So nothing against Martin Sheen, but I do think that Brian Cox was actually would have been a better fit for this role. I, I think if it was Martin Sheen, everyone would have been like, oh yeah, he did a good job. But I don't know. I just feel like Brian Cox is a better choice. Anyone else think that? Put a comment down there. Everyone should think that, in my opinion. So Alwyn Kelly is the person that they got to be the dead body. Um, they made a, a decision that they weren't going to go with an, a practical effects like fake dead body for the autopsy to happen on. They were going to go with an actual person and use um, prosthetics and uh, stuff like that. And then I do think there are some there are some moments where it is like the practical effects, but overall when they're showing like the whole the body, they want it to be very realistic was the idea. They wanted it to not have any chance of looking fake or like a prop. So they wanted an actual person. So they got this woman named Alwyn Kelly and she was selected to be Jane Doe because of her, as they said, her yoga experience, because she had the ability because of that to really regulate her breathing and movement as she laid motionless on the table. And if you really pay attention, she did a very good job with being dead. That's not an easy thing to do, I would think, especially when you have some of the longer shots that happen. So she did an awesome job. Uh, the cinematography in this looks great. It looks really good. It was directed extremely well. The cinematography is really awesome. It looks really nice. It looks like really drab and dark, but it also looks extremely crisp and clean at the same time. So it, that's a kind of interesting dichotomy. Uh, I really like the kind of tracking shots that they do throughout this film, uh, mainly like when they go through the hallways with the camera, but also when they're kind of like tracking sideways in the actual morgue portion of the building. They just look good. They're, they're very smooth, and, they're, and the angles that they're done at, just it looks nice. Plus with you know the environment they set up, the set design looks really good. Uh, it sets up a very intriguing story about people trying to get out of the house, in the very, very beginning of this. When when the body is initially found by the um, by the police department in the old people's home uh, in their basement, like half buried in the basement, uh, it, sends, it sets up a really interesting premise of making you think like, because they say like it looks like these people were trying to get out. Uh, and you're just like, what? Because that makes no sense. Like, the, with the way it's set up, it looks like maybe it was like a home invasion thing initially. But then when they're like, it looks like someone was trying to get out. That's when it immediately is like, there is something going on here that we're going to have to guess at. And we may very well not guess. And we'll have to have like a cool reveal. And I do think that is the case with the film. So I love that. I love those types of films. Love it. Um the facility that was used in this actually very appropriately looked like a mix between a mortuary and a house. I thought they got kind of the perfect aesthetic because, you know, they have to create the feel of this is a family-owned business because it's the father and the son doing this. And, um, yeah, I just think they got the right aesthetic for that. Uh, it's unsettling in this film when they first t tell you about the bells on the toes of the dead bodies where they kind of say, oh, this is to make sure the people are actually dead. Like, that talk is very, like, ugh, because it makes you realize that um, they're basically saying that somewhere in the past it has happened where they thought someone was dead and they just got up and were dead. And uh, that then necessitated the need, or that then created the need for doing the bells on the toes. So that, it's, it's unsettling. But the other thing is that's a very cool foreshadowing moment of how the body that they're doing the autopsy on Jane Doe is not dead I love those little things uh that you can see as as foreshadowing that you don't understand the first time around when you watch it is foreshadowing this is probably the third time I've watched this film so it doesn't it, it's really great with a rewatch because there definitely are those things that you don't catch the first time around because you don't know the full story and then going back, you're like, oh, this was a hint, and this was foreshadowing. And the, the, the talk about the bells on the toes is, is one of those moments. I also really like the foreshadowing of Stanley the Cat being very, very upset with Jane Doe's body. He's, like, hissing at it and, like, growling. 
and um, that's kind of that play, which happens a lot in horror films, of like the animal instinct. Like if animals don't want to be there, you should not be be there. If animals are afraid of something, you should also be very, very cautious. Uh, so I like that kind of moment in there. Then there was this line that, that was also foreshadowing where it said, everybody tells a story, which is actually the entire premise for this film. It's the body telling a story as the autopsy is done. And it's a very cool and original idea, in my opinion. I love it. I have not seen this in any other film, to be honest. Uh, and it unfolds at a very, very nice pace that keeps you interested. At no point do I feel like it drags too much. It, I mean, runtime-wise, it's not super long anyway. Uh, but I just feel like even with with slower, or sorry, with shorter run times, there can be moments in films where it feels like they're stretching a scene a little too much or it's just kind of stagnating a little bit. And this film, it, that never happens. It feels like they're having things happen at a very nice, appropriate pace. And the reveals of all the little clues leading us to the very end where we find out, you know, that Jane Doe is a witch uh, and not dead is, um, yeah, it's really well done. So I like that. Keeps you interested. So the severed tongue portion, when they start doing the, uh, autopsy, you know, they find that like her ankles and wrists were broken and that stuff. You're just kind of like, you know, that's a little weird, but like, okay. But then when they open her mouth and you see the tongue has been severed, that is the moment when the audience is basically like, there's something messed up going on here, which I mean, you probably assumed that knowing that you're going into a horror film and knowing that the name is the autopsy of Jane Doe. So that indicates that it's all about the autopsy and something that comes out of it. So but that moment, like, on screen, when it's the severed tongue, you're just like, there's something weird, interesting, and sinister going on here. And you would be right. Uh, the autopsy procedures they show in this are appropriately gross. Um, they look realistic. I mean, I've not watched autopsy before. I've not been around anything like that or seen videos of actual autopsies or anything because I don't have interest. I'm, I'm not into the real-life stuff like that, like medical procedures and stuff, which is weird because my wife is totally fine with that, with watching that stuff, but she won't watch horror films where it's fake because it feels too real to her. And I'm just like, you do realize that when you watch like medical procedures uh, on TV and in videos on YouTube and stuff, that that's real. And the stuff that you think is too scary is not at all real. <laughs> so it's just weird. But anyway, they did a good job with the, with, you know, making it look realistic. Uh, another awesome foreshadowing moment in this is the line, every ritual has a purpose, as an extremely strong hint as they start uncovering things like the scarring inside the body, the, um, well, particularly the piece of cloth that was sh shoved down the throat with the tooth, and the flower, I think it was a, like a moon, <sighs> I forget what, what the flower was called, it was called like moon something, I don't know, sorry. But it's not that important. But anyway, the every ritual has a purpose. That is such a great line. And it is very strong foreshadowing. It lets you know, you know, there was a ritual that went on here. It was about her being a witch. But we find out that maybe she wasn't actually a witch when it happened. Which goes to another thing is I love, love, love that, that idea that's thrown out in the film uh, by, I think it was, was it? I can't remember if it was Tommy or his son who, who said it, but that basically the idea that this was a ritual because they believe she was a witch when they found out when the body was from. And they think that actually what happened is the ritual made her a witch. She was a normal person in the first place, but the ritual itself and all the horrible things she went through before she died, before she died the first time and wasn't fully dead, made her a witch and kind of made her immortal as this body uh, and able to do the terrible things that she then does to people. Uh, there are moments of silence used in this to very great effect. Uh, that's one thing I know if you've been watching all my videos or a bunch of my videos, I bring that up when films use silence, which not a lot of films nowadays do. All of them kind of feel like they have to always have some sort of like soundtrack going on or some sort of like background music to let people know how they should feel. But when you use silence well, it can be unbelievably effective. And I think in a film like this especially, it's very appropriate because in a place like a morgue, you're not going to 
have a whole lot of noise. You know, it's going to be very quiet because it's dead bodies. So um, the other thing is I feel like that allows tension to be ratcheted up a lot more when it's just like dead silence, especially when there's an evil there in the building and you and you know it's there. It kind of makes you feel like you're listening for noises kind of like the characters are of like trying to figure out like where things are in the building and if something's coming to get you. So it works very well. There's a, uh, a moment of like when the fire happens, when they try to burn the body and the fire goes up to the ceiling and everything. And they're showing it like the, the ceiling's all ablaze. That's CG fire. And it looks kind of bad at moments, not consistently, but in certain shots when it's focused on a little bit longer, it looks kind of bad. And this goes to another thing I say all the time in my reviews. Computer graphics do not, do not, do not hold up. They will never hold up because there will always be advances in how good it looks. And then when people are going back in comparison, it's going to look terrible. One of the films that I know people talk about, I have not seen, but I've seen like clips of it and to know what people are talking about. But people say that like Stephen King, the Stephen King film, uh, The Langoliers was done, I think in the 90s and they used computer graphics back then and it just looks laughably bad. That is a prime example. Don't do computer graphics unless you absolutely have to. Don't. Um, but it's not too bad in this one. So there, there are some really hard moments in this. There is a lot of emotional impact in this film, and I think it's done really, really well. Uh, with when the cat dies, I mean, for me, that's that that hits me kind of hard because I'm a big cat person. I have a cat who I've had for oh my god, like ten years now, and she's she's my buddy, like she's my best friend, and she, um, you know, we're extremely close. So whenever you see things like that on the screen, if you're like a big cat lover then uh, it makes you think about your cat and when your cat passes away and, and the grief that the person on the screen is is uh, emoting over the death of the cat makes you think about when that time comes for you. So those types of things hit me kind of hard and so that was that was a tough moment. Uh, but also when when the kid uh, the son's girlfriend gets killed, I mean, man, when I first watched it, I didn't see that coming because I did think that it was one of the dead bodies. It was kind of like reanimated by the uh, the witch, by Jane Doe, which there's a question in this with the way that that's done. It's what it, are the bodies like actually kind of reanimated or is this all stuff that she's created in their heads? So that's a question. Put a comment down there and let me know what you think about that. But um, yeah, that moment where like Tommy like hits her with the axe like, you think he's hitting, like, one of these dead bodies that's come back to life. And then when you see it, it's her, like, with this giant axe wound on her chest, like, dying on the floor. And then the son just losing it. It's like, oh, my God, it's so heartbreaking. It's, it's really well done. Really well done. The acting, the directing, the writing, all of it. So I like, yeah, I already talked about this. The, the idea of the premise of the ritual of creating the witch. Love, love, love that aspect of it. Uh, and I really like how the body moves on, which is a really good ending because it sets it up for a sequel. And I would love to see a sequel to this. But just the premise of, you know, they talk about it at one point about like the body making its way places. And it's the idea that like it needs to, it's been moving from like place to place, person to person. But I guess it's taken it some hundreds of years to make it as far as it is. I forget where... Oh, it's in Virginia. The film takes place in Virginia, and the body's from, like, Massachusetts area. So it's taken, like, a few hundred years for it to get that far down. Who knows where it's actually trying to go, but it's cool that you see in the very end that, like, this is how the body's moving. Like, it creates a crime scene by killing the people, and then the police show up, and they move the body to a morgue, and then, you know, the people die there. Like, it just keeps moving. The, like, people move the body for it. So... Uh, very good ending, especially with uh, at the end when when the like toe of Jane Doe moves just a little bit, like pretty creepy. Good stuff. So I want to talk about like some kind of overall themes real quick, and then I'm done with the review. I'll give my star rating. <sighs> Excuse me, got a hair on there. Um, so there's a lot of, in this about mental illness. Um, it's it's a subtle thing that's talked about with with. Um, excuse me, with Tommy and his son, but their mother, they, they kind of revealed that their mother was mentally ill 
and she ended up taking her life. And Tommy felt terrible about it. Like he let everyone down because he let her down because she killed herself and he wasn't there for her. And he let his son down because he let that happen to his son's mother. So there's there's a lot. This whole movie takes place in the, with the backdrop of that because that's the trauma between these two individuals is the death of, of the mother because of mental illness. And one of the big problems is the impact on both of them because you see the impact on the father, on Tommy, as his guilt because he feels like he wasn't there. He didn't properly help her he he wasn't able to save her but then you also see that with the son when his girlfriend is killed and he blames himself just like his father is blaming himself uh, you know for his wife's death and it's like a like father like son this this family's cursed type thing you know history repeating itself in a sense where you know the who they love dies and they felt like they could have done more and it's their fault so it's it's a very interesting parallel between those two, and I think it plays well as a theme. Um, the other thing is all of Jane's, this is what I wrote down, all of Jane's injuries are internal, much like mental illnesses. It's all internal. You can't see it on the outside. Uh, Tommy takes the burden from her, which kills him, and he does it to save his son. So with the idea in mind of the guilt that Tommy has because of, how he wasn't able to be there and wasn't able to take the burden from his wife. And that's what led to her, to her killing herself. Um, he, he's making up for it in the end of the film, basically by telling Jane, give me everything, give me all your internal injuries. And I will, I will take the burden of that in order to save my son. And it's kind of like if he had done that originally with his wife, then he could have saved his wife, therefore could have saved his son, all the trauma. So that's kind of my feeling on it. But uh, yeah, that's just my theory. Uh, put some comments down there. What do you think about any of this stuff and about the movie in general? I really do enjoy this film. I think it's quite well done. So um, time for my star rating. So five stars possible, half stars in play. I'm... I'm going to give this a four and a half. I think this is a really good film. It's really well done. You can tell it was probably kind of low budget-ish because, you know, it's in one location. But executed extremely well. The budget was used very, very well. Looks good. Great story. Pretty original. Holds up. It's good. It's really good. And I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. So... Thank you, everyone, for checking out this review video. Um, like I said, put some comments down there about what your thoughts are on the autopsy of Jane Doe. Hit that subscribe for me if you can. That's your big way to pay me back. If you like any of the videos I do, this one included, that's how you motivate me to keep doing it and pay me back because I don't make money doing this. I'm just spending my time throwing these things out there. So uh, literally takes you a second. can mean a lot for me. But thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.